Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which has so many things going on that are turbulent and full of uncertainty and consequential outcomes that I'm not going to list them. Um, I normally do. I'm Andy Revkin. I've been on the climate and sustainability beat. This is my 41st year, 41 years uh, asking questions. Basically, sustain what is my daily question. Don't don't talk to me about sustainability. Sustain what? For whom? How? When? Then you're talking. And today we're going to talk about something very far from most people on the planet, krill and whales and uh, a growing industrial fishery in the Southern Ocean, um, particularly near the Antarctic Peninsula. And, you know, we're, I had a session on here last year with Ian Urbina, who's built a, an entire beat around the, the, the outlaw ocean, the ocean outside of national boundaries. And uh, the ultimate example of that, I think, is these fisheries that have systems in place for some sharing, some care, but, but there's so many unknowns. And as you're watching imagery that was shot, uh, as I just heard, uh, just in January of 2022, so early, almost two years, is it two years? Wait, 2022, 23, right, two years ago, uh, our first, our top guest there, Connor Ryan, who's a um, conservationist, has a background in zoology, um, is a photographer and a, a wildlife uh, tour guide, um, had was on a, a Lindblad ship, which I'm going to be on one actually in a few weeks, uh, heading for the Solomon Islands from Auckland, New Zealand. I haven't done that before to speak about uh, various things. So you were out, you were down there, you know, with a group of presumably uh, well-heeled tourists on a on a one of the Lindblad vessels. And tell tell us what you were seeing here, and then we'll get into the into depth with the other guests who are really uh, have done great journalism and great policy research around this. But Connor Ryan, what are we looking at here? I got I got the impression, but and how much of a wow was it? Uh, so what we're seeing is is. You know, it, it's surprising in several ways. Um, you're seeing a, a huge abundance of whales. That's all these spouts that you're seeing, their breath in the cold air. Um, but you're also seeing a scene of of, um, uh, of of fishing on an industrial scale that perhaps people don't associate with Antarctica. We think of Antarctica as being pristine, untouched, pure, right. and, and and left alone to, to recover from the effects of whaling. But uh, what we're seeing is a, a very much industrial scale fishing um, in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. Um, more specifically, we're seeing an enormous group of fin whales, and there were some blue whales in there as well, and, and humpback whales. Um, we were in this area um, to land on Coronation Island, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, kind of northeast of the Antarctic Peninsula, and we had um, an incredibly good day, actually, weather-wise. The visibility there is often very poor, um, so this is unusually clear weather. And I was kind of going on a tip-off from a colleague who had gone through this very area in November, uh, the previous November, and he said they had seen the most incredible number of humpback whales. So uh, that's what we thought we were coming upon when we saw the the blows, and we were surprised mm -hmm. to find out the humpbacks had mostly gone and were replaced then by a large number of fin whales. So, um, and that's the second largest whale. Or just the blue whale is the only bigger animal on the planet. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Second largest animal um, in the history of life, so far as we know, um, mm -hmm. and certainly the species that took the hit the most. Um, from commercial whaling down here from the early 1900s um, up until 1970 or thereabouts. Uh, the fin right. whales were the heaviest hit um, because they were the most abundant um, and, and so large, they were profitable to, to kill. So um, sure. quite heartening to see so many fin whales back uh, in that area. Yeah, and we'll explain, you know, this is after a century of, actually centuries of humans uh, running around extirpating whales as much as we could, as far as we could reach the Soviet fleets in the, I think the 60s, 50s were very busy in that area. And and so here now we're looking, uh, Joshua Goodman is an Associated Press reporter uh, based in Miami. And here you were very far from Miami. This is a package that ran last October, I believe. And uh, I'm sure it was in the works uh, earlier. So so Joshua Goodman, you did a big package on what the, what those whales were fishing for, essentially, and what the uh, the boats were fishing for. And uh, could you t talk about the package that you produced for AP with your multimedia colleagues? 
Yeah, hi. So, you know, we I had heard about uh, the krill fishery um, and I'd read some reports on it and certainly, you know, learned a lot from just the science and the market around krill products. But I really wanted to do something that really f few or no journalists have done, which is actually see the fishery up close. That was sort of the genesis of this project. Um, and so we went down there with the conservation group Sea Shepherd, myself and another AP journalist. Um, we captured some of these amazing images. And, you know, obviously the first thing we see was sort of what Eric was talking about, the close proximity of these fin whales. These are all fin whales to these, you know, industrial trawlers the size of football fields. Um, and yes, it immediately destroys any sort of notion you have of this being sort of a pristine fairy land of, you know, uh, whales living in complete harmony with this ice scape all around them. Um, it's very highly concentrated, the, the, the fishing, and, and it's very jarring, um, both from a visual standpoint, but also just because we're in an area that is really uh, sort of um, humanity, it belongs to all of us. I mean, it's, 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 right. it's literally controlled by an international treaty. And it's the sort of place kind of that occupies like in our imagination, something akin to what maybe the national parks for many Americans are like a place that you kind of just want to have left alone. Um, but it's right. not left alone. It's a place of intense commercial activity. Um, from these fishers, from tour of vessels, touring vessels. Um, and so it was, that was sort of how, how, how it all began. Yeah. And I'll, I'll swing back because I want to ask you about the, uh, you know, journalism is constrained in many ways when we're trying to get to faraway places or uh, like in battlefields, the journalists I know who've been battlefield correspondents, you're essentially with the army or you're with the Navy and you're very beholden to what they're showing you or not showing you. And here you're with Sea Shepherd, which also was the whale wars folks. And, you know, they very much have a point of view on things. Um, and I've been in these situations too. We'll talk more about that. And then, then we have here, um, Nicole Bransom, who is with Pew Trusts. And, and you've been involved with, uh, this arena, sorry. Um, it, it, Pew is, a has done in every area that I've dug in on, including flood resilience and, and, um, here, conservation policy and science, Pew does a very good job of sort of navigating the dimensions and coming up with uh, analysis and, and options. You have this report on krill at risk, ocean at risk. Uh, Nicole, and thank you so much for coming on a very, very short notice. Um, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about why, you know, why, why these tiny little crustaceans in the, the furthest oceans ma should matter to, to uh, folks. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I do have a few slides that I will be showing. Oh, right. Yeah. If you hit share, if you didn't already, I can, uh, let's see. You just hit the share button and then they pop into a queue um, where I can then show them on screen. Got it. Okay. While you're doing that, um, I, I want to swing back to um, Connor. You did a paper. Um, with other authors that kind of summarize what you were seeing that day in January of 2022, uh, while the slides from Nicole are coming together. Um, tell us, you know, essentially what are the findings at that intersection of fin whales and uh, extraction? Um, yeah, the, in essence, the, the paper was to demonstrate that uh, crib fishing and very high densities of wildlife are co-occurring and therein there's risks and I, I guess like you were saying with journalists it can be hard to get to um far-flung places the same for for biologists like myself um so to actually get in among the krill fishery is, is quite difficult uh, and a rare opportunity to get a glimpse of, of of what it looks like from the outside um so we saw an incredibly high density of fin whales it was a um, we estimated 1000 individuals in that's, in, so, that's so mind-blowing just that number yeah. Um, and and four krill fishing vessels in in with those whales. 
I, it's unimaginable to me. I, I've been at some aggregations of whales, um, but maybe, you know, in a dozen or two. And, and Josh, I assume you saw that too at, at some point, uh, these big aggregations. Oh yeah, I mean, and you know, it's 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 not a coincidence that both the fishers and the whales are going for the same same resource, the krill. I mean, they are on top of each other. Um, the boats are on top of each other, and then the krill are on top of the, the 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 boats are on top of the whales. We would see you know ten or fifteen within you know a few feet of the boats. Um, it's sort of you know surprising to me that there haven't been more interactions. Um, in 2022, there were four mortalities of whales. Whales got caught in entangled in nets. But, you know, honestly, it, it, it would seem like the conditions are ripe for more of that just because they are fishing in such close proximity to one another. And hold on. I want to see if the slides are here. Oh, I think I see them. Okay, hold on a second. Here we go. Back to you, Nicole. So tell us a little bit about this. Uh, the, give us the overview here. Absolutely. So... Krill are this critical base of the Antarctic food web. They're a food source for most of the animal species in the Southern Ocean, which surrounds Antarctica. And for some species like birds and marine mammals, they even provide 96% of the calories for the animals down there. So another thing why they're actually globally important is they play this really important role in carbon storage in the global biological carbon pump. So Antarctic krill, after they feed on algae that has absorbed atmospheric carbon dioxide at the sea surface, they, meant they then migrate down in large swarms to deep water and they excrete their waste there. So in that way, they're transferring large amounts of carbon dioxide to the depths of the ocean each year. And they're actually each year storing the equivalent of, of carbon of about 35 million cars each year in the deep ocean. So um, these are some of the ways that Camlar is important. Josh mentioned Camlar. It's the convention that is established to protect krill and also the ecosystem. It was established in 1982 in response to the growth of the krill fishery. Uh, but what's actually really unique about Camlar, that's the acronym for short um, for the convention, is that it sets conservation as the objective where fishing is allowed only if it doesn't have a negative long-term impact on the fish species or the dependent species. And that's actually where we're seeing a bit of a problem now. So um, the fishery for krill, uh, the fishery is going to support um, krill oil supplements for human consumption, your omega-3 oils, and to humans and animal feed, um, including for aquaculture for farmed fish. So this just highlights who's been fishing for krill. The fishery really started with the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s until the Soviet Union collapsed. And then in more recent years, other countries have emerged and this has been led by Norway. Right. And in the, yeah, in the last couple of years, uh, we still see Norway out in the lead, but actually China has become a close second. And um, the Chinese fleet actually has um, newly launched fishing vessels that use the same cutting edge technology that the Norwegian Jews, uh, which allow this kind of continuous pumping for krill. So in addition to the fishery um, itself, climate change is having huge impacts on the Antarctic. We hear this all the time. It, krill are certainly no exception. So they're really well adapted. Uh, their whole life cycle is dependent on these cold, icy waters of the Southern Ocean. They need that ice to complete their life cycle. And the Antarctic Peninsula, where most of the fishing is happening, is actually um, warming faster than almost anywhere else on Earth. And krill have already been shown to have shifted their range 275 miles south. And climate scientists think that this is going to continue to happen. Um, Ocean acidification is also hurting krill themselves. Uh, science suggests that by the year 2300, the krill population could collapse because of ocean acidification. And then in addition to climate change and fishing, you have all these other threats on the ecosystem. So there's now plastics that have been found in krill and their predators like penguins. And the new bird flu has been found on uh, wow. the subantarctic islands and in the Antarctic. Uh, we're expecting that it would probably be in the Antarctic soon. 
And so, um, Andrew, you had asked me, you know, what what the key needs are for the fishery, what what could happen to actually make it sustainable. And um, really the biggest issue that we see with the fishery is this issue of concentration. And so these maps, uh, which are in that report that you referenced, really just show how the fishery has changed over time. In the 80s, the fishery was all around Antarctica. But now, actually, the fishery is totally concentrated around the Antarctic Peninsula. And then within that region, um, these graphics show really how intense that concentration is. And that's where you're going to have an impact on the predators. And so industry likes to say that the fishery is sustainable because they're only catching 1% of the krill population. But the problem is where that krill is being caught. It's being caught in near shore areas right near where predators are feeding. So um, these data show this, these two areas here, um, they're smaller management units that you can kind of report krill catch. Uh, these Bransfield Strait East and West units, which are the, the orange and yellow here, um, they're, these two areas are seeing 74% of all of the catch for that whole region. Yeah. Um, although they're only making up 8% of that surface area. And so I, hold on one second. I just I'd love to get Josh's uh, input here too. Josh, I assume you were also around the Antarctic Peninsula, that area, or where were where were you focused? Uh, Correct. Focused? Yeah. No, that's that's where the krill are. That's where the fishing is. So that's where we were. Uh, absolutely. And it's also I should mention um, where the tourists are on the vessels. I mean, this has. I'm, I I couldn't really get an answer as to why krill why they're fishing there. I mean, the krill are everywhere. The best answer I found, though, was it's also the area closest to the mainland. Sure. And this is an incredibly, you know, unproductive, highly inefficient fishery. The amount of miles that each of these vessels has to travel to collect their resource and then bring it to a port where it can then be processed and, and shipped to global markets. This is kind of the closest place. This is where Antarctica sticks out mm -hmm. and almost touches, you know, the, the tip of Tierra del Fuego in South America. So that's, to me, the reason why they're there. It's the same reason why the tourists go there. Um, it's just the more, it's the closest part of Antarctica. It's also, though, an area that's one of the most biodiverse areas in Antarctica. And it's the reason, you know, it's where the big whales are, the big mammals, marine mammals. So, you know, there's a lot of activity going on there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, research stations as well. But, yes, we, we were right there. You know, the, as, as was pointed out, the... Um, by Nicole, the, the you know the, the krill fishing in places farther north, like near uh, South Georgia Island, has largely shifted because the ice has disappeared, and, and the krill depend on that ice to to survive that first year of their lives. They call it recruitment, and if you don't have ice, the krill don't live, basically. Yeah, N Nicole, I want to get back into your slide deck in a second, so hold on. Um, uh, there's, I want to show a couple of images, and your deck will still be there. We can come back to it. Uh, that get to this issue of the proximal nature of the fishing and the whales, and what to do about that. Um, hold on, present, share screen. I hate this. Oh, um, here we go. There are observers on these uh, vessels, right, Nicole? the observers on the cam camelar, <laughs> camelar uh, signatory vessels. And there was this incident, this was in 2021, April. I love these, we see these birds right here in Maine where I am, but I've never ever seen an aggregation of bufflehead or that's or that kind of bird like this, but there in the net, that's not krill, it's a, it's a whale. I'll just go to the next slide. So there is mortality, at least a um, few. Um, maybe uh, Josh and then Nicole, you could talk about how the monitoring takes place. And, and then Nicole, we will get back into your, your presentation, but uh, have the companies acknowledged this, uh, Josh first and then Nicole, and, and what, you know, is this considered such an aberration that it doesn't diminish the idea of sustainability or is this a, a real problem? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack and I think one thing that just I want to emphasize in terms of our work as journalists, um, this, these images were not easy to obtain. Uh, they're buried on a website. Um, 
from a task force that was uh, created to sort of study these incidents. Um, So, you know, if you know where to find them, you can find anyone in the public can find them, but actually being able to republish them as the AP and, you know, like most media outlets, we have our standards. We, you know, we have to get permission in writing from the person who owns the photos. And usually that's just a signature, but this was uh, over a month of back and forth trying to find out who owns these photos uh, do we have permission for them? And yes, these were taken by observers that are uh, obligatory in all the ships. Um, I don't think it's though an image that anyone in the industry really wanted out there because they sort of do drive home the, the direct competition between the whales and the fishing ships. These specific incidents um, were investigated by a committee set up by the International Whaling Committee at the request of Camlar. Um, you know, at one point, the company, uh, an Acker from Norway, uh, suggested that the whales may have already been dead by the time they sort of showed up into the nets. They were juvenile whales. I, I don't think that's ever really been clear what led to to, to the mortality event. But what is clear is, um, you know, it wasn't, they weren't dead. I, the, the, the conclusion of the report was they weren't dead by the time they reached the, 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 the nets. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of um, changes that happened. Uh, Acker did try to strengthen some of the, the netting so that would repel the whales. But then, you know, like a few few months later, a fourth whale also uh, wound up dead. Um, yeah, these are isolated incidents. This was the first time it ever happened. And, you know, as, as has been pointed out, um, or the first recorded time it's ever happened. Um, and I think we would know about it because there are observers on the ships. But... Uh, you know, nonetheless, will it be the last? I don't know. Is How many of these are people willing to tolerate before right. they sort of question the whole utility of this of this fishery? That's not for me to decide, but it, it, it does drive home the question about the direct competition between whales and humans for a single resource, which is krill. Right. They're, coinc- they're coincident in the ocean. All right, Nicole, we'll get back to uh, your slides here. I just have to... Uh, yeah, it's and you know even the Endangered Species Act has language about takings. You know every uh, the, right now the offshore uh, wind industry in in Maine uh, or across the New England coast um, there is an assumed there's an assumed impact on whales um, and virtually everything we do on land and in the sea uh, even for listed species can be uh, this you can never have a perfect system but where that balance sits is a really important question. So sorry, sorry again, Nicole, back to you. No, thank you. You know, I think these these whales being caught are really a symptom of the bigger problem that Camlar is not, although it has this mandate, they're not yet effectively um, taking the predator needs into account. And, and these whales really show that. But there's some other strong evidence that's actually come out in the last few years um, with respect to penguins. Actually, um, some re- different researchers from the US, from NOAA, and then other researchers from the Chilean Antarctic Institute have both shown that even at current fishing levels, that um, the combined impacts of fishing and climate change are having negative impacts on uh, both certain populations of penguins within the Antarctic Peninsula region and the the trajectory of those penguin populations across the region as a whole. So this is really, you know, what we, the the greater NGO community um, and and even Camlar have been working towards um, trying to set up a new management system that uh, really gets to the root of this problem. And so uh, this graphic kind of shows what that system could look like or or the the scientific system that would support um, one of the solutions that Camlar has been working on. So a new management system would need to be more science-based in order to spread out the catch of krill in space and time. And so Camlar has committed to do this and they've begun to take steps to do that. And they've agreed to implement this program that's based on um, ship-based surveys to update the biomass estimates or the amount of krill that's out there. Uh, And then following that with updated stock or population assessments, which give an indication of 
um, what the size of the krill population is and, and what's the amount that can be fished. Um, and then finally, Kemler has agreed, the Kemler scientists are using this, what's called a predator risk assessment. And this analysis, uh, what it can do is look at how much krill are actually needed by predators. So penguins, whales, and when we're talking about whales, we're talking about a lot of krill, like orders of magnitude more than the fishery is actually eating, or right. than the fishery is actually fishing rather. Right, right. Um, so th there's that piece. And then the other piece is marine protected areas. And uh, marine protected areas are a solution that can not only um, help the fishery itself by providing resilience and a spillover effect for the fishery, but also help biodiversity, species densities, and can provide resilience against climate change. And so um, CAMLAR, the management organization, has actually made a commitment to create a large scale network of marine protected areas and has uh, created a regulatory legal framework to do so. And this map shows the whole potential network of protected areas in the Southern Ocean as within the CAMLAR waters, as well as within um, waters of national jurisdictions. And there's, there's currently already two marine protected areas within the Kamlar waters, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and the South Orkney Islands Marine Protected Area, um, the latter being actually really close to the videos that Connor was showing us with the large aggregations of fin whales. And now there are four marine protected areas that have been proposed to Kamlar that they're considering for adoption um, in the Weddell Sea, Antarctic Peninsula, um, Eastern Weddell Sea or the Weddell Sea Phase 2 in East Antarctica. And all of these MPAs together would protect actually more than two and a half percent of the global ocean, uh, making a significant comp contribution to global targets where leaders and scientists have agreed that it's important to protect 30 percent of the global ocean by 2030. And then um, finally, I just wanted to highlight that uh, one big opportunity this year, actually, is there's a meeting that Kemler has agreed to hold in July. And mm -hmm. the idea is to actually bring together these two tools, the marine protected areas with the ecosystem based management, a more science based management approach um, in a holistic way. And so Kemler has agreed by consensus to hold this workshop. So we are really looking forward to that opportunity. Um, but just to quickly review, um, climate change and concentrated fishing are having pretty bad impacts already on krill and their predators. Kamler has a mandate to allow that to essentially not happen. And um, Kamler is not effectively monitoring right now to determine whether that's happening or not. And so solutions include, you know, this network of marine protected areas harmonized with the ecosystem based fisheries management plan, which would include increased monitoring of predators, um, as well as also enhancement of the compliance measures for the fishery. Great. Well, um, I'd, I'd love to get uh, Connor back into the conversation in the context of uh, what you think about the prospect for management here. You, you, you talk in that area, you have the basic ecological dynamic. You have a lot of change, as we just heard, climate change is changing patterns. And you have uh, the fact that the whale fish, the whale populations are still resurgent from generations of human uh, extirpation. Uh, what what would make you feel confident that, that we're headed in some kind of, towards some kind of balance that keeps all of that in, in, in mind? Um, well, I suppose the reporting of, of what's going on, which, um, you know, is a kind of a crisis unfolding, uh, the fact that we have eyes down in this part of the world um, for the first time um, and that we can raise awareness of it and the, the great work that, that Pew and others are doing. Um, and I think it's, you know, there's a few things going on. Um, I want to pick up on uh, on some of the maps we saw there. You know, the marine protected areas, the blue areas on some of those maps, there's still fishing... At, permitted in, in some of those. In fact, some of the biggest uh, krill catches are happening within those marine protected areas. So that's not to say that marine protected areas are perfect. Um, mm. There's still large catches happening there. Um, the key thing, um, I think, from what you just heard uh, from the presentation was that 
the, the concentration in space and time is the key issue. And at the moment, um, Kamlar is, is kind of treating the Southern Ocean like a giant pizza of krill. And they're trying to carve up all the slices and, and dish them out to whales, penguins, seals, uh, and the krill fishery. But in, in reality, the nature of krill is that they don't arrange themselves like a pizza slice. They arrange themselves in, in um, really, really dense aggregations. And those aggregations change from year to year where they occur, even from day to day. Um, and I think the, the krill fishery is getting better and better at finding out where those krill patches are. Um, and that's ultimately why the, the fishery is, is concentrating in the same areas that whales like, because the whales have uh, a long cultural memory of where, where to go to, to catch the krill. So we're finding this um, conflict between whales and the krill fishery is, is, is growing. And it's grow growing ever more because um, whales are recovering from the effects of whaling. Um, kind of one whale generation into um, the prohibition of, of whaling in the Southern Ocean. Um, so there's been a lag um, where they, they just start to you know, recover very, very slowly. And we're seeing the signs of that, especially with humpback whales. And it's interesting that they're the ones that are being caught in, in some krill fishing nets. Um, that's what you'd expect based on the kind of recovery trajectory. Um, humpbacks could be close to um, fully recovered um, Blue whales are going to take a long time to recover yet, uh, and fin whales probably also. So this problem is only going to uh, worsen, this interaction between um, the krill fishery and the whales. Not just the whales being caught, but their food being taken from them uh, is essentially right. the, the, that's the main concern, actually, is direct competition for the good stuff, which is the krill. This is so interesting to me because it brings back to mind uh, years and years ago, um, partially through Sea Shepherd and and I was reporting on um I did a lot a lot of reporting almost 20 years ago on whales resurgence leading Japan and other countries to get to abandon the the whaling international whaling commission uh norms and uh, Japan was saying we have to manage the whales because they're competing with us for for <laughs> the uh the fish <laughs> and it got really ugly, and that's where Sea Shepherd came in again. Now, I want to bring in, uh, I, I, I couldn't, uh, unfortunately, I reached out to them on too short notice. Acre, Acre Biomarine is by far the biggest player, I think, here, except um, except China maybe emerging. But um, Acre Biomarine is part of a bigger company that's you know, sort of, a, they, they have, what do you call it, a vertical. They have the krill oil and the whole, whole schmear, and their website is um, very much in defense of what they're doing. A blog post, polar ecologist says levels of krill fishing impact on predators should be determined by data, not untested belief. Um, new science confirms big surplus of krill and a precautionary fishery in, Antar in Antarctica. And also I did, uh, they, I reached out to them and, and they did send some talking points, uh, which I'll just tick down and maybe Josh and, and Nicole and, and Connor, uh, let me just tell you, these are some of the assertions of Acker Biomarine. Um, one, well, krill is among the largest unexploited marine resources in the world. This is already one of the most precautionary catches uh, that exists, meaning it's very tuned to be minimal. They say the fishery is not experiencing a boom. As Basically, we're coming back to what, what was normal back in the 80s, which uh, when you look at the charts, uh, that is correct. Um, it's transparent. We have onboard observers, uh, as we were, we're hearing too, um, and that, uh, and then they have these trade-off issues. You know, we need protein, we need these these oils, we need to, to feed the planet, heading toward nine billion people, uh, with the fewest regrets. But the fewest that's you know the, that's what I used to call my blog at the New York Times. Dot Earth was, how do you have a planet with nine billion people and the fewest regrets? And so there, that, that's kind of some of what uh, the company is saying. Um, and maybe, uh, Josh, given your reporting, uh, what would you say to some of those points? Yeah, well, you know, there's many ways to slice that krill pizza, uh, as Connor has left me now with that impression of a very uh, disgusting pizza. But um, there's many ways to do it. I mean, a lot of what uh, Acker says is, 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 is factually correct. Um, we are at levels that perhaps, you know, this Camlar as an organization was only created because this problem was pretty bad in the 70s and 80s under the mostly Soviet, uh, you know, Soviet trawler fleet that was down there. 
However, you know, I think we're at a tipping point right now, and there are certain stresses that were not there um, previously. I mean, beyond just the concentration, which is, you know, uh, both P everyone at Pew, Connor, Nicole now have said that that is a major concern. But climate change is also one that I think, you know, previously was not as well understood. Um, and, and, and perhaps in the 80s, you know, it wasn't as warm of a planet either. So there are just additional uh, pressures beyond the fishery itself that were not there previously. Um, I will say, though, you know, and, and we engaged quite extensively with Ocker for our reporting. They, they found them to be a very open company, um, uh, willing to engage, willing to have that debate. They, they basically have taken a view that they'll talk to anyone, even people who uh, have diametrically opposed views and think that this fishery should not exist. But, you know, there, there is, and I, when I hear Nicole and Connor talk about some of the shortcomings of Camlar, there's a consumer element here that is, I think, overlooked. Just basically, people don't know what they're buying when they're right. buying that little red pill that shows up on the shelves of their local pharmacy. Um, and all the sort of work um, and resources expended to get that to market. And, you know, Acker really believes in their products. They talk about it in almost messianic terms. There, I think one of their corporate mottos is we want to, you know, save the earth and save human beings. I mean, they talk about it in this very um, um, hy hyperbolic, I think is the only way to say it, way. And, you know, I, I just don't think people really know all that's involved. I mean, just take one point. The carbon footprint of this fishery is incredibly high. Um, you know, just to, to get down to that part of the world, the thousands of miles from port, uh, you're burning, um, you know, 3,800 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every ton of krill extracted. And let's compare that to other fisheries, anchovies off the coast of Peru, which are also used like krill uh, in fish meal. You know, that's one, that's one sixth the carbon footprint of this fishery. So, you know, this is a product that has seeped into our culture in the last 20 years only. I'm talking yeah. about the pills now, the mega three pills. It is, right. you know, mega three is an important, uh, an important nutrient for our, for our diet. But you know, most people don't know all that's behind that. And you know, there's other sources of omega three um, that are, you know, frankly, a lot more sustainable from an environmental standpoint. Um, and you know, so I think that that was also part of the goal in this product and project is to educate consumers to know what's behind that little box on their, you know, pharmacy shelf. And yeah, I think we're still in the early stages of that. Um, um, and Nicole, I don't know how, how, when when Pew is looking at this. I assume you're. Uh, one of the questions is, what are the needs of society uh, in terms of uh, the food that we consume going forward through the next few decades? Um, it's not just about the status quo example right now. Right. So. It's important to point out that the products that are being derived from the krill fishery are luxury products. This is not a food subsistence issue. We're talking about, you know, feeding farmed salmon. We're talking about omega-3 pills. Um, you know, somebody pointed out in the chat, there's, there's fish oil that you might get in the body of water that's right next to you, not um, in, Go, having to go to the Southern Ocean with such a large carbon footprint. There's also um, plant-based sources, algae-based sources of omega-3s. So, you know, that's something that consumers should be aware of. Um, yeah. One of the things, you know, I, I should say, we should say that um, Acker and the Association of Responsible Krill Harvesting Companies, the Industry Association, um, it's it's good to have a dialogue with them to, to come up with solutions. And they, um, you know, have done some good things already. Acker supports this Antarctic Wildlife Research Fund, which gives some money to predator monitoring research. And um, the industry as a whole has started these voluntary closures um, in some of the areas where a marine protected area could be in the future. So just to clarify that Antarctic Peninsula Marine Protected Area is not there yet. 
Mm. And so um, that it's it's a really good start, but it's really important to point out that you know this is a small number of companies and individuals that are profiting from a global commons, a global resource. And so what we really need from them is, you know, if they're going to continue to do so, that they provide the leadership to get that sustainable system of measures in place, whether it's, you know, leadership and being vocal to get all of their members on board for the marine protected areas, um, or, um, you know, really one of the really important things is, is the monitoring. They're, they're putting some money into predator research, but it's, it's really not enough. There's not, you know, they had a quote in the notes that they sent you about, we need to have, uh, we need to not trust feelings. We need to trust the science and what it's saying. Well, we already have some science showing there are problems and we need an effective monitoring system in place. And so if they're the ones that are benefiting from that, we really need to see them putting some resources behind that to make sure that, um, you know, they can really tell that they're meeting Kamler's mandate of not having that negative ecosystem impact. And I fully agree with what Josh said. Um, you know, climate change wasn't there in the 80s and 90s and Kamler's starting to think about it, but they're not really effectively managing for it. And so this really needs to be a part of the equation as well. Yeah. And can I just interject one thing I want to make? I wanted to correct something, Nicole. I mean, they're not profitable, though. That's the whole thing. When we talk about sustainability, one thinks of pro that also in terms of profitability. Well, this is a not uh, this is a very highly unprofitable fishery, which should also be part of the decision making process. I mean, on the part of Ocker, it's a company that's sustained by crude oil. Uh, the company is owned. It's integrated into a you know one of the biggest offshore oil developers in the world. Uh, it's it's basically the the project of, you know, the vanity project of its billionaire founder, um, mm. Inge Roque. There's a side story there I can get into about how basically in the 1970s, he was kicked out of the United States. And that's what led to the creation of his interest in the krill fishery. Um, and then on the part of the Chinese and potentially in the future, the Russians, I mean, there are other considerations for those countries um, having more to do with geopolitics. Um, but, you know, this is not a place to make money. <laughs> and, you know, so we're throwing, we're putting a lot of things at risk um, for, you know, not a lot of gains environmentally and potentially not even a lot of profit for the companies that are involved. Well, but that reminds me of, um, there was a, a big, oh God, it was Enrique Sala and others did a, a peer-reviewed study of subsidies driving these international fisheries. This is why this is fishing, you know, wider than krill, um, and and they're enormous. Uh, Europe, uh, uh, particularly, and China, especially. Um, so I guess that, Nicole, for, for sure, I'm, I'm sure that that's something that has to be considered in the, in a world where subsidies for fossil fuels are being pressed uh, against. Uh, the subsidization of these fisheries, if there, if it exists. Um, is certainly uh, something to consider. Yeah, there's a great reference, um, a paper that was put out within the last few years by uh, Rod Capel and his colleagues with uh, a group called Poseidon, and they looked at the, dif the different economic aspects of the fishery and uh, the different subsidies from the different sectors. And there's certainly a lot of subsidizing happening um, but they also showed in, in that paper that based on the money that's coming out of the fishery, only a very small amount of money coming from the fishery would be needed to actually do the predator monitoring that's needed. I think it was something like 3% of the profits. So, it, you know, we're not talking about something that's undoable here. Yeah, well, it, it would certainly, now how would that, other than making the case here on this program and in, social media or in your reports uh, is there something governments can or others can can and should be doing to have that be sort of an accepted part of the practice of expanding this this fishery or others that they're fully subsidizing whatever research and transparency need to be part of it 
Again, um, there's that workshop that I mentioned that's happening in yeah. July yeah. this year um, that Kemler is committed to. And so it, it's a workshop of Kemler commissioners and scientists to come together and, and find solutions in terms of the ecosystem based management system and integrating that with the marine protected area. So that seems like a, a critical opportunity to have some of these conversations, not just during that meeting, but even in advance, right? That's one of the challenges with CAMLAR is that it's a meeting that happens once a year, but the Antarctica, the, you know, the Antarctic is down there experiencing these threats all year long. And so um, these dialogues really need to be happening throughout the year to make progress, not not just once in the, a year, which is it's really challenging in a consensus based organization. There needs to be a constant dialogue to see change. Uh, see change, S-E-A, <laughs> see change. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you, I'm just looking here at some of the um, the pitches that are out there for um, the boom side of this. Want to sell Norwegian protein powder made from krill to the USA, uh, Australia, New Zealand? Uh, this small yeah, crustacean can I be used as a supplement in protein shakes, energy bars, and food items. So the the growth is being pressed substantially. So even if Acker Biomarine is saying it's we're not back to the uh, levels uh, in the 80s, certainly the plan is for a lot more. It's interesting that they have the 80s as uh, they're holding it as some example of what was sustainable or or um, responsible, which was yeah, that was a disastrous um, you know event to to that one nation should land that many krill. Um, it's a very low bar to set uh, for any fishery. Um, it was a um, you know completely um, reckless what was happening then. Um, th there's several things happening. You know the krill um, populations and krill density is declining. All the time, their, their their very existence is dependent on sea ice, which of course we know is declining because of climate change. Um, so against that backdrop, to want to uh, expand um, and further concentrate the krill fishery is is just unthinkable. Um, I think, kind of reflecting on one of the reasons this issue is is so you know is so offensive almost is because it would be nice to think that there was a place that we you know we almost destroyed the ecosystem down there um by extirpating the whales or almost extirpating the blue whales um it would be nice to think that um we could just let some place alone um and let it recover and it's trying to recover and the evidence is on the screen there you see big densities of of large whales again sites that probably haven't been seen for 100 years um but we risk um undoing all the good work we've done in in uh in you know not killing whales not impacting the ecosystem um by allowing um these profits to continue um and just one one more point i wanted to make about the um where this krill is ultimately going although you might not see um krill supplements on every shelf in every shop um many people are interacting with krill in a kind of a secondhand way, which is um, most of the krill, as far as I understand, is ultimately going to feed farmed salmon. And I think mm. one of the big problems we have is salmon companies um, don't have to declare what they are feeding the salmon. So in essence, if you're eating farmed salmon, the the, the likelihood is you're actually eating krill. Um, it's just been converted into salmon. And I think um, that's a big problem way we could make inroads on uh, increasing awareness of, of this problem and how we're all well not all but many people are kind of subsidizing this problem and, and making it profitable yeah well and that gets to this important op re it's a reality now you can know to a significant extent what you're eating uh qr codes theoretically can lead to a lot more detail on uh, at least for companies that really want to live up to pledges of transparency and supply chain sustainability, yeah. that That's information the, can be there. The final product, but for if you think about, not, they don't have to declare. Certainly, where I live, it's, it's our biggest food export in is in Scotland is um is farmed salmon, and it's yeah. incredibly difficult to find any information about what the various companies are feeding to their salmon, and yeah. certainly not on the packaging. And and when you dig deeper to the salmon companies themselves they they hold it very close to their chest uh, what it is they're feeding right. uh, to their salmon well and hopefully that's, that's an excellent... oh, sorry as you said that's an excellent point we try yeah. to chase trace some of those supply chains it's a very concentrated market uh the market for um fish meal but uh, you know what we found is that several of them do use krill and small and right now small amounts 
but it's a key ingredient because so much of the fish meal now is made out of land-based products. And that's actually a good thing. I mean, that's sort of how the industry has been moving in, in recent years. Um, but, you know, that, that 100% I couldn't agree more, Connor. Nobody really knows all the inputs into that fished, uh, that farmed salmon that's on their plate. Um, if it's wild caught, yeah. But if it's a farmed salmon, that's about as far as you, you know. You maybe know it was raised in a fish pen somewhere in Australia or Scotland or Norway or Chile. But, you know, you don't know what those fish in that pen are feeding on. Um, and again, I think it just goes back to the fact that, you know, consumers are very um, uneducated about this. But you, you know, trying to, trying, trying to get the answers to those questions from the uh, fish meal makers about what percentage of their fish meal comes from krill, or what volumes they're using. That was also a real challenge in, in writing this article. And by the way, the writing of the article was really important, but I do want to stress the um, extraordinary nature of the audiovisual multimedia components of the, the work that you and your colleagues did. Can, can you just briefly sketch out some of that? I'm showing it without the sound here, just so, you, so folks can get a little bit of a sense of the package. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we worked on this for months and it really was a team effort. And you're right. I mean, we wanted to make this a, a, pro a project that would reach people. So the visuals were um, essential. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing we had interviews, I think, on five continents, <laughs> people in Europe, um, uh, people in Tasmania, Australia. Uh, we went to the headquarters of Acker. Obviously, we were in Antarctica. We went to the port in Uruguay where all of the um, fish meal uh, that's brought from Antarctica from Acker is shipped to the world. We went to a former ice cream factory in Houston, Texas, which churns out 80% of the world's uh, krill pills. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of effort that went, that went into capturing all of those images and capturing all the views. There's Nicole's colleague, Andrea, who was a huge help uh, on this project. Um, you know, so yes, it was it was quite fun to do and and to 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 work as a team to get this out. And has have you had any sense of um, impact so far? I know everyone always asks about impact to us journalists, and sometimes it's hard to measure. But uh, have you seen something percolating that might not have been percolating otherwise? Well, we we know it was a topic in the room in the Camlar meeting in October. We timed the release right before the October meeting of uh, Camlar. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, really, I wasn't present at the meeting. Um, it did have a, a unfortunate timing. It was also the same week, uh, of the Hamas invasion of Israel. So yeah. it kind of got lost in the fold a little bit, but you know, this is a story that's not going away and, you know, hopefully our work will be there for others to kind of discover and, you know, raise questions. And, and, and it, like I said, I think the real question here is one of an existential one, um, you know, not whether Ocker and the industry itself are, are good actors or not. I think they have a lot of things to be proud of, actually, compared to some of the other fisheries in the world, for sure. But, you know, the question of sustainability is, here's a product, a non-essential product uh, that people are traveling thousands of miles around the world to capture and, you know, indirect competition with these whales in one of the most beautiful um, parts of the world. Right. Oh, it should be pointed out, you know, krill and whales are found everywhere. Uh, there's plenty of krill, uh, you know, there, it does, there, there's a lot more in, in Antarctica and in the Arctic, but there's krill off the coast of the United States as well. Uh, the U S does not allow krill fishing. Um, and it's because of the precautionary approach. Basically they don't believe that there, it's just too much of a risk to, to take place. Now I don't know that it would ever be profitable in the U S it do do some krill fishing in Canada. I recently learned but, you know, this is something that we wouldn't allow off the coast of Monterey, California or Maine. But um, it, it, it is allowed in Antarctica. And I think it's partly because of the governance issue. I mean, you know, to expect governments from uh, dozens of governments from around the world to come together and agree on anything. It's pretty hard to do right now. Um, so, you know, my, my hopes for, for a real vigorous um, you know, sea change uh, from Camlar, I think are pretty minimal. It's just, it's proven to be an organization that it's increasingly hard to get things done. And although it certainly has a very, you know, uh, admirable history, 
uh, on this issue, um, so, you know, they, they've, they've really sort of um, been, been, been stuck in time a little bit. Yeah. Well, this has been a great um, introduction to a really important issue and hopefully opportunity. Hopefully we're not stuck with this, but the these um, ungoverned parts of the world finding ways to use data, journalism, transparency, consumer awareness, um, and all these uh, and science, basic science. Uh, it, it's there. I guess the good news is there's something everyone can do, like with climate change, which has the same dimensions. It's it's you know the atmosphere is a global commons, and but and it's complicated, but that means everyone can do something. Um, and I'm really glad that you and, and the Associated Press, and I guess the Walton Family Foundation, the Walmart family, uh, their foundation uh, provided the funding for uh, this work. I don't know if that's specifically for ocean reporting or the like, but, um, yeah, or for, for uh, that's not project by project kind of support, right? It just goes- No, 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 no. We have, we have a blanket grant from them to yeah. boost our coverage of the oceans, but they have no role in the stories we choose um, I've never spoken to anyone from the Walton Family Foundation. They had, yeah. as far as I know, they'd ever even spoken to my editors. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, you had raised a question earlier. You know, we went with Sea Shepherd, a conservation group. But, you know, we, 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 we paid our way. We paid our room and board. Yep. Um, you know, we, we, we take our, our, our integrity very seriously. And, you know, obviously the AP isn't chartering vessels to go to Antarctica. So we do have to uh, seek help. Where help is provided, but um, yep. you know we, we try to put some guardrails in place so that nobody can question our independence or integrity on these issues. Yeah, well, I, 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 it's pretty clear in the reporting. I, I hope that Walmart uh, CEOs who, who claim to be, uh, well, you know, I wrote about Walmart 15 years ago and their push on sustainability, and you know they could have a QR code saying, "Hey, you know, this salmon came from this place, and we don't feed it this." That when we get to the day where that kind of clarity is 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 normal. Uh, that'll be a better day than where we are right now. So thank you all for being here today, Nicole, particularly for jumping into the last minute. Uh, um, but also Connor, we Connor and Joshua, Josh, uh, Joshua Goodman. We've been talking about this for weeks. Um, I'm glad we're fitted in now. You know, October. If we can keep this work front and center for people, um, and maybe maybe before the meeting in July, we can reconvene. I I, I I'm quite sure with more advanced word we can get Ecker Biomarine into a conversation here too. I'll just say this is Andy Revkin. Uh, Sustain What is my webcast. You can look at that distracting scrolling bar at the bottom to get in touch with me uh, with feedback to get in touch with the guests. And uh, please do spread this. It's it, It'll be streamed. Uh, it, it'll be archived right away on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter, wherever you're watching now or afterwards. And uh, more to come always. I have a show coming Thursday with uh, Roger Pilkey Jr., who's a climate uh, policy and disaster researcher who has been very inconvenient and in sticking to the data. And sometimes even when it's not convenient to, uh, to um, our activism around issues like climate. And there's more always, revkin.substack.com. Thanks, this is great. More the better, more the better. And good luck with uh, getting through the rest of the winter. Uh, it's been interesting up here in Maine. Take care. Thanks, Andy. Take care. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much.